I think we were excellent. What we were thinking of was less here is a particular experiment that needs to be done to what is the infrastructure that's required to do creative um, and innovative research that will enable people to do that kind of research rather than what is the individual experiment. So it's infrastructure and people, actually, and people came first, as perhaps they ought. Uh, so we thought the, the network was the most important aspect to, to follow up on. Um, so to, to place that in the context of the center of excellence, actually the center of excellence is not just a center, it's a hub and spoke, it goes across the whole country. It is not expected to be you know, a, a clique of individuals in one place. So a network, what does a network actually do? Um, it will require people to work together. And if there's any funding through the network, it will disallow anyone from working alone. Um, we have to think about a network, not just from the you know, middle-aged uh, investigator, but we have to think about, older, uh, have to think about the, the early career investigators. Um, and you know, even if we make great strides in ME research in the next five to 10 years, we will still need to do more. So investigators who are starting their career need to be uh, absolutely supported um, and particularly supported to, to, to get the career funding that is exceptionally hard to get by anyone uh, so that, that they can um, make their, uh, their mark on the world. That's number one. Um, number two is, is a different type of infrastructure. Um, and it, it, this is exposes my bias. This is genetics. That's me. Okay. So others may say otherwise, but to me, genetics, but we're kind of doing that. But let's not forget that we probably do need the whole genome sequence at some point. It's, I think it's too expensive currently. Others don't think that, actually. Our precision life think that that's the next thing to do. Um, am, I, am I saying anything wrong? I, I, no, I, I think there are some other routes that you could go down that will get you there quicker, but um, it, whatever happens, it's still going to be a significant excellence. Okay. We need to get to wherever we need, need to get to quicker. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and that'd be fine. And an Oxford man, of course, needs to have their say, and other technologies uh, need to have their say uh, in this. Um, we need data, which is uh, both from the electronic health records, uh, genotypes, and then questionnaire data, phenotypes. All of that linked through, plumbed in, need all of that. Um, and we need that to be connected, not just with data, but samples. Um, and we've really thought about, talked about two different types of samples. Um, and I was saying we need, you know, large numbers. So we need to draw upon bioresource and share where the samples are intercepted, they're clinical samples. And I think there was some support for that, as there was support for the targeted, uh, you know, we, we need a fresh sample, not a, a frozen blood sample, we need a fresh sample from this individual for this reason, and it could be spinal fluid, not just a blood draw. So we um, need a network, we need the genes, we need the data, we need the blood samples, we need the bespoke um, collection, which will be a clinical collection. Um, and that's not something I can, I can do and help with. I think those were our top priorities. I'm looking around the room. If anyone else in the workshop or out with the workshop has anything to say, please, Joshua. I'll just add the, the order Chris stated those is quite important. Um, they intersect the uh, privacy patient, the uh, yes, yeah. priorities in decreasing order, essentially. So the network should affect all of them, approximately. And then as you can move down the list, it's next fewer, so they are approximately ordered by what, uh, what is with any time. Thank you. So as to how to do that, I mean, it's, what, what I would hate is to have this kind of meeting. <clears throat> we all agree and then we go off separate ways and nothing happens, right? This, this, I've seen this time and again. So 
once I've sent in my next grant and answered reviewers' comments to the one before, um, the third thing on my list will be to try and set up a partnership. Okay, uh, from here, Martin. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, um, Chris, for that. And the word that's actually struck me throughout the day and actually leading up today is about accelerate. And there was a comment from somebody earlier on that said, I want to weep. I don't want to wait another 10 years for research. So what we can't do is to be standing here, in, or some of us here in 10 years time, having the same conversation. We've got to start making that happen. And, you know, as Chris said around the partnership grant, that's something we're sort of starting to talk about. We want to work with others. The Centre of Excellence is all about us all working together, not a teeny tiny charity with a great big book quite small scientists. This is about us in having a huge network of people that includes the voice of, of people with their need. Um, I, the second workshop was um, asking the question, how can we forge collaborative links with researchers who are not currently active in this disease area? And Stephen Holgate, um, I should say, Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, who has been an absolute stalwart in this field and has helped drive um, all the activity that has led to the Decode ME funding. So on behalf of everybody, Stephen, I want to say thank you um, to you. And, um, you know, it's always a pleasure working with you. And it's been an absolute pleasure having you join us today and to, to chair the workshop. So I'm going to hand over to you to give us a summary of the, the, the discussion that you had. Well, thank you very much. And uh... Somehow, by some miracle, I mastered the technology, which uh, for me is quite an achievement, I can tell you, having wandered around the ether for the last five or six minutes. Um, look, this has been a fantastic meeting so far, so I've learned a huge amount. And thanks, Chris and team, for putting together wonderful speakers this morning, many of whom I haven't met before. But I think it helped us uh, as a panel in our discussion to kind of reframe the debate a bit really by seeing what the potential of new research has to offer in this field. And of course, we were talking a lot around biology and genetics and potential therapeutic interventions. So it's all very practical stuff. So there are about five points that came through our discussion and uh, there are subheadings on these, but I won't go into those. Um, everybody, I think, uh, agreed in our group at least, that we've got to make connections to the long COVID community. I mean, this is ridiculous that we've got parallel things happening right up at the top all the way through the system. And of course, one of the things that uh, several of our um, guests in the panel said was that, you know, we've got a lot to offer this community. It's not just the other way around. Um, so I'm not sure what the mechanisms are there, but obviously from a research perspective, you know, there are bridging studies already happening, and Chris, you're doing one of them. And I had another example of a second one today. But we do feel, I think, that we need to make more effort to make sure that the funders of research, as well as the researchers, involve uh, long COVID control patients or parallel studies so that we can try and look at where the common links are uh, with that group of conditions. Now, that's not just a vague hand-waving um, request because we know there's substantial funding uh, in the long COVID, orders of magnitude greater than in the ME funding arena. So that I think is a very, very good reason why. And if the long COVID community and their researchers go in a completely separate way to the ME, we're going to be in a very difficult position in a year or two's time. And I, I think that, I'm not sure what the mechanisms are. None of us had clear mechanisms, but we've got to do it. And this has to happen because uh, if we don't, we're letting people down on both sides. The second point that came out, and it was well illustrated by the Norwegian presentation today, uh, was the regard was, was the kind of uh, the thought processes behind ME, uh, all of the stigma, all of the history, all of that stuff that the uh, the um, DHSC Attitudes and Education Working Party are talking about at the moment, has been a huge impediment for getting researchers involved. And you don't need me to rehearse that with you. 
But I think, you know, we are now in a world where complexity, multimorbidity, interdisciplinarity in the medical sciences has become very much part of the mantra. And therefore, our, we feel that not only from the sort of research community side, but also the funders have got to start seeing this as part of the um, interdisciplinary multimorbidity agenda. And autoimmunity is one area in particular that has bubbled to the surface. And we know in COVID how important that's been. And, uh, and the biology, as we heard today, is um, pointing a little bit in that direction. So complex multimorbidity, um, interdisciplinarity, number two. Number three, um, I think we need in some way to uh, possibly approach all of this um, by not necessarily parking ME within a given speciality, but maintaining uh, the multi-organ approach. So it kind of moves on from the second uh, point I've just made. Because we know that sleep, genetics, immunology, um, you know, neurology, imaging, I can go on and on and on, are involved in the research uh, community uh, in ME. And in a way, we need these communities to um, connect with the equivalent communities probably within the uh, long COVID world, uh, where there is already progress being made. And we should somehow need to take the experts and, and build a network which has respectability built into it. So it's not thought of as a forgotten non-existent disease area anymore, but it's a real genuine biologically motivated set of disorders of which there are going to be multiple, um, uh, multiple research areas which are going to be profitable. The um, fourth area that came out was one of the reasons we think that people don't go into this area is because there's no career path. It's got no identity as a, a way to make a career. And for both basic scientists and for clinical scientists, whether they be in medical or um, health practitioners in other areas, ME just hasn't been an area where people can grow their careers. So on the capacity building side, the training fellowships, the intermediate fellowships, the senior fellowships, we need a proper career approach to the ME. And I'm sure that discussions being had in the long COVID area at the moment and why it's probably attracting some young people into it because there is a, they can see a career evolving over time in that. Um, I think the final point uh, that um, was made really was a very, very interesting uh, aspect of your meeting, Chris, this morning was having industry involved. Um, we obviously had a company, um, Precision, I've forgotten their name for the moment, but uh, you will know, um, Precision Life, um, who came into this for a reason. And it would be very interesting to know what that reason was and what motivated them coming in uh, and whether we need to start up in parallel with this reactivation of the research arena um, in ME, uh, beyond decode ME, and whether we can actually have some conversations with some serious people in industry, um, who I think will appreciate in long COVID that there has been massive investment by industry. So this is not a foreign area for them. And maybe we need to try and reconnect. So that's an awful lot of words to say five points, but I do genuinely want to thank my panel today for their very helpful suggestions. And I will try and put these down uh, in some um, more cogent <laughs> arguments to present to the research committee of the DHSC uh, meeting, which Ian Bruce is chairing. I can't hear Sonia, but I assume uh, I can see your lips moving, Sonia. Unless... 
But it's, it's, it's you know, not often that people get to silence me in that way. Um, I believe Claire put me on mute. Um, I, I was just um, wanting, I thanked um, you, Stephen, and also the workshop group members. But I just wanted to highlight, uh, Stephen just mentioned, the ME National Delivery Plan that is a government-led delivery plan working in partnership with a whole range of people, including people with um, lived experience of ME. So all of the feedback today, we will make sure that, that gets fed back in to the Department for Health and Social Care, but also to the funders, the MRC and the NIHR, both of whom sent their apologies, but we will be reporting back to them because there's some very valuable points. Last but not least, um, the third workshop was at looking at the question, how do we ensure that patient and public involvement or PPI is at the heart of research? And there were some really important points that came from that, but I have to confess, we spent most of the time talking about Decodemi, and I've got a whole page full of ideas, because um, that's where the energy was in terms of wanting to talk about and share ideas to help increase the number of participants. But that said, there were some um, really good points that, that came through. The first one is that we have to lead by example, that the network as part of the centre of excellence must require patient and public involvement at the heart from anybody that's working as part of that network. And where people aren't able to do that, then actually part of our role is to help support develop that capacity, because through the discussion, feedback from group members was that Decode ME is really setting um, the standard. It's way beyond things that people had seen, even in other disease areas, and there's some examples shared by group members. And therefore, as, as a network of people together, we should be supporting others to help achieve that standard. But we did recognise that there's money going in to support the PPI with the code ME, as there was with the priority setting partnership. So, and that's even before grant funding comes. And so there are some real challenges there. We talked about how we include um, a wide range of severity in terms of ME, but also um, those who are not white, those in different geographical areas, etc. And um, talked about the balance between online and offline, how we can engage through carers to reach people to hear the voice where the disease really does prevent them um, engaging directly with us. Um, how can we be creative with that? and a sad recognition that we're never going to be able to reach or involve everybody, however hard we try, and that should be acknowledged, that's a limitation of the work that we do. So as we, as the same as we call within science, we should be very clear about our, our limitations. And um, the um, other thing was that we should have a conversation with the funders and ask them to assess the level at which they require PPI in their applications. Now, Many of us here could probably tell you what the outcome of that conversation might be. The NIHR has set as, as work, their work has led to setting the national standards. So actually, how do we work together as a community to ensure that those are put into practice in all aspects of research funding? So unless there's anything else any of my group want to add. I'm good to hand. Can, can I yes. just add on the PPI? The UKRI and, and other organisations have signed up to this. So thinking about the past and how little funding there has been uh, contributed to projects on PPI, I don't think is a good forecast of what's going to come. No. So I, I actually think there's an opportunity here to fund things properly in funding applications, uh, because I think uh, reviewers will not dare to cut that. I Absolutely agree. And, and we should expect that. I think the other issue for us was, as was the case with Decode ME and the priority setting partnership, where's the money to support that from the beginning? So any design happens with people with lived experience and carers at the heart of that, not by default once the money's in place and it can be paid for. And it's charities like Action for ME and others that actually funds that at this stage. And that isn't good enough actually there has to be some mechanism for supporting that and supporting researchers earlier on so i would agree but i think there's a and also a bit to that so i'm going to hand over to chris to finish off the day thank you to everyone
people have come a long way from overseas. They've used up valuable energy. They've thought very hard about what they're going to say today. And I've learned a lot. Um, this is always a humbling experience working in this area. Um, and today is one such day. Um, please do feedback what you think worked, but more importantly, what did not. What we should be doing and we, what we are not. If there are aspects to the uh, logistics today that didn't work for you, I want to know, please, because we need to do things better. Um, so I've already thanked you as individuals. So I want to thank the um, Action for ME for all the work that, that you're doing um, tirelessly. Um, and I look forward to seeing all, you all at different times uh, online or, or in person. Uh, this is a center of excellence, I hope, and you'll all be very welcome whenever you wish to come. Joshua, uh, sorry, Luke is going Oh, to... yes. So <laughs> as, as a, a coder to our meeting, Luke is going to say something, I think, sorry, about the... We can slide that, I don't know if it's good. Oh. I've got to tell you that. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> I touched, I didn't mention it, so say a few words, just forgot about this one. That was such a nice conclusion as well. <laughs> <laughs> so someone pointed out earlier that if I... Uh, yeah. So I'll show you all my emails. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look. Sorry, Chris, that was totally my fault. Um, there it is. Coming up. Yeah. Oh. Something went wrong there. Apologies. Uh, if you can just share your screen. So, um, start switching. Oh, yeah, okay, so uh, I'll keep this relatively short because, uh, as Chris said earlier, it's been quite a long day. Um, and I'm sorry for, for ruining that nice kind of round conclusion. But I hope that this is kind of uh, a positive kind of note to leave, thing, leave things on. Um, so, for those of you that don't know, there's a lot of unfamiliar faces for me. Uh, my name is Luke Marnie. Uh, I'm a first, almost second year PhD student at uh, King's College London, and I'm studying the genetics of people with ME in the UK Biobank. Um, I'm also the Secretary General of the Future Leaders Group and the group's representative to the Partnership Board of the Genetic Centre of Excellence. Um, so you must be looking at this and that logo in the top corner, and you know, what, what is he talking about? Um, so the ME Future Leaders Group is a network of postgraduate students and early career researchers um, spread across a few different universities. So predominantly University of Edinburgh, we've got a few members, uh, Oxford, and also King's College London, where of course I'm, I'm based. And what we are is we, we're a sort of collaborative uh, peer support network. Uh, we had a lot of meetings over the last year or so before kind of beginning to formalize things um, where we talk about our work and about ME research and kind of support each other. So uh, Chris, Chris talked a lot uh, just now about uh, a network and collaboration. And we sort of have a very miniaturized version of that. And uh, Stephen Holgate mentioned a few moments ago that ME is a field that people don't feel they can grow their careers in. And that's kind of our big overarching goal is we want to support our members to be able to grow their careers. Um, and so we're doing this in a few ways. So the first is through peer support and collaboration. We're talking to each other and getting to know each other's research. And we're, we're already reaping some of the benefits of that. So 
these these are all students that I would never have met otherwise because I'm based in a different area. But I've been able to get to know what they do and ask questions, and we've been able to send each other, uh, you know, bits of code or or graphs and and stuff like that. Um, and we're also doing internships. So, for example, you can see in the in the photo in the top left corner, a couple of our members missed our uh, summer school in person. They they attended online because they were in uh, in Nevada with uh, Dr. Dan Peterson at uh, Simran doing uh, an internship that's funded by Action for Me. And we're hoping in future to, to kind of secure more funding for stuff like that, for internships and for training for our members. Uh, last month, we, we had a summer school, which I sort of alluded to, and, and this, was, this was our group photo. Um, we talked about a lot. We had lots of sessions and presentations from people. Um, but I think the, the kind of the real benefit that we got from that was sort of these soft skills elements um, of being together in the same room for the first time and getting to know each other and kind of building those relationships. Um, since then, we've kind of decided to formalize the group a bit more. So prior to the summer school, we just had uh, lots of meetings over Zoom and that, and that was still super, super beneficial. Um, but we held elections to set up a committee. Um, our chairperson, uh, Inga, couldn't be here in person today. I believe she's on the Zoom call um, because she's in Nevada um, enjoying uh, one of our internships. Um, and we're actively recruiting. I say actively. Uh, we're open to new memberships. So if there's any students uh, online or in the room that feel they might want to be a part of this or uh, any more established researchers that feel one of their students might benefit from, from becoming a part of our group. Um, I would love for, for people to, to email me at uh, the bottom left corner. I just wanted as well, I'll, I'll wrap up now. <laughs> um, I just wanted to take an opportunity very quickly um, to say thank you to Chris for chairing all day, um, Sonia and Action for ME, um, for kind of setting all of this up and supporting our summer school and our internships and hopefully hopefully supporting us into the future. And lastly, I wanted to thank all, all of our speakers today who have taken uh, a lot of time out and traveled a long way to, um, to speak to us all. Um, and I'm sure everyone uh, really appreciates that. So um, yeah, thank you for listening. Right, so that's hands. <laughs> right, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs>